Hello everyone, today we are going to talk about ethical rules with reference to W. D. Ross. Uh, we have been talking about uh, rule deontology, deontology in uh, general and rule deontology in particular. We have talked about Immanuel Kant, who provided us with a deontological system, which was without content. Now, let us just, before we start talking on Ross, let us uh, quickly recapitulate what Kant said as a deontologist, what deontology was and what uh, Kant as a deontologist said and as to what uh, Ross as a deontologist is different. Now, deontology as we remember was that uh, uh, version of uh, moral theory, which did not subscribe to non-moral goods as uh, being the final ult or ultimate judgment criteria for uh, making a moral judgment. So, there was something atomic or fundamental about uh, moral values, most of them based it on moral rules. Uh, Kant started, uh, the earliest example before we talk about Kant, we talked about Kant, the earliest uh, uh, example of deontological rules was that of the rules of religion. Now, religion has certain do's and do not's, which uh, uh, were atomic in nature and which did not depend on any consequences for its justification. Now, comes Kant. Kant uh, also stuck to deontology, but in a different sense. In fact, uh, Kant's deontology, Immanuel Kant's deontology was not uh, about rules, as much as about it was uh, meta rules, or it was what he, he would recollect called the categorical imperative that there is uh, no content in his deontological ethics, but there is a formula or rule or a meta rule to be more precise, which determines uh, what rule is a moral rule and what rule is not a moral rule. That was universalizability. Uh, the universalizability criteria was the meta uh, rule to uh, decide the morally right from the wrong. Now, we come to another example of uh, 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 rule deontology that is W. D. Ross. Now, taking a look at the slide, you will find, well, first of all, W. D. Ross was a philosopher who tried to work out, who tried to work out a deontological ethics with content, that is, he gave us certain duties. Ross postulates his moral theory on moral rules, a version of which is termed as the prima facie in Latin, which means in first glance prima facie duties. Prima facie duties are duties that become apparent or evident on the first encounter with a moral dilemma. Ross view is that our actual moral duty in any situation has to be arrived at by weighing our uh, prima facie duties and deciding which is most important. Now, let us understand what Ross is trying to say. Well, Ross postulates this thing called prima facie duties. Prima facie uh, is a phrase that you would have uh, perhaps uh, come across uh, um, in a legal terminology as prima facie evidence. So, he uses the same uh, uh, phrase in the same ethos that there are certain prima facie duties, just as prima facie evidence in uh, uh, legal terminology would mean that evidence as it is found at the scene of the uh, incident. Now, prima facie uh, uh, duties are also uh, duties, which uh, Ross prescribes, which are at the um, uh, moment or at the moment of uh, interface or at the preliminary uh, inter interaction with the circumstance. Now, just as prima facie evidence does not uh, make an indictment, it is absorbed, assimilated and a judgment or a, a case is filed, it is uh, a, a examined in detail and a final judgment is arrived at. Similarly, uh, Ross claim is that, well, uh, prima facie duties are not some things that are immediately your duties, but which are duties that crop up in any uh, circumstance. So, and uh, then uh, what uh, looking at the slide again. Ross view is that our actual moral duty in any situation has to be arrived at by weighing our prima facie duties and deciding which is most important. So, Ross here makes a distinction between actual duties and prima facie duties. Let us go to the next slide to see what uh, further she talks about. Now, what about the decision? Now, as we uh, saw in the earlier slide, uh, 
Ross talks about the decision is to be taken by the agent in, cog in due cognizance of the particular situation to arrive from the prima facie duties to the actual duties. So, there can be a hierarchy amongst duties when other components are equal. There can be no absolute hierarchy amongst the duties. Now, this is a crucial uh, thing that we need to pay attention to. Now, when confronted, Ross gives a set of uh, duties, which is called the prima facie duties, but these prima facie duties are a few duties or seven duties, which do not apply in every circumstances in a fixed hierarchy. The agent or uh, who is in the center of the action has to decide, taking in uh, cognizance the situation, the circumstances, what is the hierarchy of the implication of the duties. So, the prima facie duties gives the uh, uh, background and the agent in, uh, uh, evaluates the circumstances and arrives at the actual sense of duties. Uh, Ross also mentions that, uh, well, there is a hierarchy amongst the duties, as you, as you would see the second bullet, that there is a hierarchy amongst duties when other components are equal. But, it, he also in the same breath mentioned that there can be no absolute hierarchy amongst the duties. So, what Ross is uh, in effect doing is, he is actually allowing there to be a fixed set of duties, but yet giving uh, freedom to the agent to dis, uh, decide on the hierarchy amongst duties. We will talk about it in a few slides from now. Let us now look at the uh, duties, what uh, the prima facie duties, which Ross puts forth. Well, uh, he says duties from the, the first duty he, he mentions is duties from the previous acts of the agent. He talks about a duties of fidelity that keeping one's commitment, implicit or explicit, be duties of reparation, making good a wrongful act. So, contrary, Ross's claim is that duties of fidelity is, well, we whatever commitment one makes, the first duty is to fulfill one's commitment, be it made implicitly or explicitly. Likewise, he uh, puts a second addendum to the uh, duty by saying duty, by calling it the duties of reparation, that is making good a wrongful act. Now, both of these are under, uh, arise from the duties from the previous acts of the agent. The second duty that Ross talks about are duties of gratitude. These are duties to repay obligations. The third he talks about is duties of justice, that is, it is about preventing inequitable distribution. The fourth duty that he talks about is uh, duties of beneficence or making better the lives of other beings. Uh, the fifth duty he talks about is duties of self-improvement, growth in the agent's own virtues or of intelligence. Sixth, duties of non-maleficence, that is not injuring others. So, uh, as we might see that these are perhaps uh, some of the most fundamental human drives that we have. Duties of beneficence is about making uh, better the lives of other beings. So, it is our duty to be as, uh, to make others' lives better as much as we can, duties of self-improvement, duties of non-maleficence, fairly self-explanatory. Now, what is the upshot of Ross theory? Now, he puts forth a theory of prima facie duties and then uh, the actual duties are to be determined by himself. Well, Ross theories remain absolutistic, yet attempts to cater the particularities of varied moral dilemmas. The rules are uh, absolute, but the hierarchy depends on the particular situation. The hierarchy amongst rules is decided by what? Well, that is the question. Now, uh, we have just talked about uh, the various rules that uh, uh, Ross has put forth, but uh, Ross does, uh, does allow for, uh, 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 does overcome the problems with deontological theories. The problems with deontological theories is they are, uh, they tend to be too rigid. They do not have a uh, flexibility. They do not take into account uh, the s circumstances, the situations of the agent and in general. So, here we see that, well, Ross is trying to find out, perhaps find out a, a midway between uh, Ross, uh, between uh, the rigid claims of deontology and uh, 
the real life human situation that we generally come across. How does he find that? Well, he, fi he, he finds that way by uh, making the prima facie duties fixed. So, that is why they are absolute, but uh, when he talks about the particularities of the varied moral uh, dilemmas, he says that well, the hierarchy determined from these, uh, uh, as you would see in the second bullet, uh, uh, rules are absolute, but the hierarchy depends on the particular situation. So, in this second bullet, he uh, Ross introduces um, the discretion of the agent. Now, how is the discretion of the agent to be decided? Well, uh, one uh, most obvious answer could be that we have a moral sense. Could we have a moral sense? Is it intuition? Moral qualities supervene on sensible qualities. We are essentially making moral judgments, because no matter that the prima facie duties are provided, but the way to arrive at the actual duties or making a hierarchy amongst the duties, that where a duty of reparation shall uh, uh, supersede the duty of uh, beneficence or the other way round. So, there can be never uh, uh, a uniformity in judgments across different uh, circumstances, but can there be a uniformity in judgments in the same circumstances across uh, uh, agents. Now, let us see what how Ross answers that. A uniformity uh, in judgments requires a uniformity in nature, human nature. Our moral ideas and moral judgments are based on certain common facts about human nature. Within our enormous variety lies some essential similarities and that is the source of our morality. Now, uh, this is what is the uh, crux of Ross claim, which we have uh, 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 briefly covered to find out that well, Ross is a deontologist, is a rule deontologist. He puts forth his rules, which he calls prima facie duties. Nevertheless, he respects the uniqueness of each human predicament or situation and the uh, decision ma making power lies with the agent uh, uh, himself or herself. R Ross deontological rules are absolutist in, th in this sense that they uh, have a finite set of uh, prima facie duties. They are flexible in the sense, because they have uh, the agent to decide on the hierarchy between the prima facie duties. So, this is almost like a middle path between uh, the rigid absolutist deontological rules and yet uh, 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 these absolute rules, which are indifferent to particular human situations, yet uh, it does not embrace the other corner, which is moral particularism, that every situation is unique and therefore, there can be no theorizing on this. You would note that the prima facie duties that Ross has, has uh, enumerated, uh, can generally be understood as uh, a basic human, uh, the drive of goodness in human beings that is fundamental to human nature. Because uh, now, for these prima facie duties, Ross requires a grounding, that where uh, is the grounding for these prima facie duties, where is the uh, locus or what is the ontology for these uh, duties. Now, Ross claim is that, Ross claim is that, these duties are grounded in the way we are as human beings. He grounds these uh, fundamental uh, duties or uh, impulses as a part of human nature. It is, it is not acquired, it is not uh, learnt, it is not religious, but it is uniform across nature. Now, notice the, the uh, 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 enormous depth in making grounding uh, these fundamental human impulses in into uh, um, into prima facie duties. He is actually making these prima facie duties absolute. He is making uh, uh, laying a ground for a set of duties which are valid across uh, civilizations and cultures. Yet res it respects the differences among civilizations, cultures, and agents by saying that well the actual hierarchy in putting forth the duties are to be determined only by uh, the agent themselves. So, within our enormous, uh, as I read from the last bullet, within our enormous variety lie some essential similarities and that is the source of our morality. 
Now, this is what uh, uh, Ross would like us to uh, believe that uh, there are enormous hum, uh, differences in human nature, but there are essential similarities and that is the source of our morality. So, we have a deontological system of uh, rules, wherein the source or the grounding of the rules is in the commonality of the hu of human nature and uh, nothing else. The uh, divine command theory again had rule deontology, but it grounded its uh, uh, rules on the word of God or on the laws made by on, on divine laws. But Ross makes a much more uh, perhaps believable account of rule deontology by uh, grounding the rules on the essential similarities of human nature. Okay.